What's up, guys? We're live and we are excited to start this conversation. Uh, thank you so much for joining this. This is happening live and in a webinar fashion. Um, I, I've got huge questions just as a real estate agent, uh, a team leader, um, someone who helps people buy and sell homes and uh, just all around curious about veteran loans. And, uh, and so I decided to uh, host this, this, uh, this webinar, this live with James Allen of Movement Mortgage. This guy is probably one of the most educated individuals when it comes to veteran loans. And I've seen him over the course of several years work some absolute miracles when it comes to these loans and serving uh, veterans simply because he knows the product inside and out. So James, thank you so much yeah. for joining me. Thanks for having me, man. I'm always anything we can do to educate the community, the real estate community or the veterans about how to actually protect themselves. This is such a fun training for me. I get to do this, uh, get to do this at the National Guard several times a year, get to do this with several real estate groups. And it's a big passion of mine. I feel like anything we can do to serve those who serve us is always a good thing. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. That's awesome. So let's get into like right away. Why, why do we need to do something like this? Because like, why are there so many myths? Why are there so many like misconceptions about veteran loans out there? Like, what's the deal? Yeah. I mean, at a high level, I think it's lack of education, right? I think for those that are educated and like today's training will put a spotlight on where people are missed. Like a lot of agents who see this today will say, wow, I did not know X, Y, Z about VA loans. There are misconceptions in the marketplace. The myths that we'll talk about today, some of them have a smidge of truth. And that truth gets overexpanded into an overarching truth, which is not actually real. And so there's these beliefs in the marketplace. But it's like anything else. When somebody doesn't understand something, they're usually scared of it to some degree. Many of the listing agents that I've you know, come in contact with over the years, as we talk through some of these things at time of offer and we educate ourselves on the reality of these types of loan products, specifically this loan product, it, it helps us to serve those folks better. So to me, it's really important because the VA loan, in my opinion, and, and I'll demonstrate this, I hope today with you, is frankly, one of the easiest loans to get closed that exists. And I know that that is almost impossible to believe for so many people, but it's actually true. And so if we can undo this, this mindset that people have that, you know, 0% down equals a weaker buyer, underwriting so hard, they take forever to close, the appraisals are a nightmare. If we can undo some of those myths and really shed light on the truth of the situation, we're gonna serve people at a higher level. And I think one of the, the biggest things is that when people get stigmas in their mind, they get that shred of like, yeah, there's a possibility for fear. It's actually the uncertainty that causes people to, you know, operate in like, hey, this is, might not be good for me. And so here's the deal right here in the comments below, whether you're watching on the webinar or you happen to be live with us right now, I need you to put in the comments exactly what you've ever thought about veteran loans. Whether you're a veteran, you think to yourself, I don't know if I can like, should I use my veteran loan? Is this a really good thing? Can I have only one of them? If you're a, a listing agent and you're like, I would never like accepting veteran loans on my listing when I'm in multiple offers because I just don't think it's a strong offer. Well, this is for you. I need you to watch this. And I also need you to hang around all the way to the end. And the reason is, is we're going to go for a little bit of time here, but you're going to either pay for your education. It's either now with a little bit of time or it's later on through missed opportunities that you're going to have not only to serve veterans, but also to serve your clients. And so at the end of this, James is going to talk about a book that he's actually written all about this. And there it is. It's a field guide to VA myth busting. He's got a new edition that's coming out, can be yours. All you need to do is in the comments, just say, hey, I'd like a copy. And that comes directly to me. And I will be sure that you get a copy for this. So let's dig in, James, some of the biggest myths that show up in the business. Here's mine. Uh, zero down is a weak buyer. I have to ask you this question. Yeah. Why is it that uh, listing agents don't understand the, the VA loan? They see the 0% down and they're like, it's got to be weak. They've got no skin in the game, James. So tell me, is that true? It's not true. And so here's the thing. The measurement of success is what varies here. A lot of times people think large down payment means more successful buyer. Large down payment of course, is a strength to a profile, but you can solve this problem with earnest money deposit. You can solve this problem with demonstrating that you have assets. Here's what's important to know about 
VA buyers in general statistically, right? And here's some basic facts for you. The average median FICO score for an FHA buyer, for example, is 672, right? For a VA buyer, and this is a stat from 2020, so you know it varies from year to year. Obviously, it'll be slightly different each year. But in 2020, it was 672 for an FHA buyer. A VA buyer average FICO score, 736. This is across oh. all VA loans across the entire country, 736. So, so uh, credit score is affected by debt to income, a history of accounts. Yeah, whether you pay your bills on time, right. how high you keep your revolving accounts. It's Credit score is basically your character demonstrated through payment history, right? And that's right. that's what it is. So when you look at a veteran, just from a credit perspective, they, they have very similar credit scores to that of an average conventional loan, which is also in the low 700s, 720, 730, right in that range, right? Additionally, if you look at median household income, FHA household income, for example, and we're using FHA because it's another government loan, right? You want to compare it side by side. A lot of a lot of listing agents are like, ooh, VA, ooh, I don't like government loans. I don't want to take FHA. I only want conventional. Well, cool. Well, let's contrast it to what people think it's like, right? The FICO scores are higher, but here's another one. Median household income for an FHA family is about $68,000. Now, this is national, right? Connecticut is a little different. We have higher markets here, could be higher here. We're looking at national averages, but the household income for a uh, veteran household, 90,156. Okay, so you're so talking about- 50% greater for them. Yeah, $20,000, $30,000 <laughs> higher as a veteran household. Now, why is that? And, and, and it actually makes sense if you think about it. Many veteran households have multiple sources and streams of income. That's right. Anyone, anyone who's fixated on understanding how wealth is built understands that multiple streams of income is the thing that does that. Veterans come out of service with training that qualifies them to start at higher levels in companies. Like for example, let's say you're working in the service on submarines and you come out and you go work at electric boat, you're gonna start at a higher level than, a, than an engineer out of college, right? Why? Because you have actual work experience from working in the military on these types of machines. And so a lot of veterans come out of service they make more money straight away. On top of that, any veteran who has any service-connected disability is going to get compensation for that. Now, service-connected disability has a weird stigma. A lot of people think that um, you know there's something weird about that. If you use a firearm in the military enough times, you will likely get tinnitus. In other words, you'll lose some of your hearing. Yeah, tinnitus is a ten percent, right? It's not yeah. Hard. Tinnitus is a 10% disability rating, whether it's 10 or 100, you know, and there's a big scale there for how this is measured, a veteran's going to receive some form of compensation. So there's a second form there. Folks who are still active reserves are still going to get compensation there. If folks were in the service long enough, they might have a full military pension that they're receiving. So someone who comes out of the military from a household income perspective, they're usually making 30 to 50% more annually statistically than their comparable FHA and conventional, you know, home buyers, right? If you look at that. So FICO score is higher, median household income is substantially higher. And then if you look at the average loan size for what they qualify for, and this is what's so great if you're a buyer's agent, working with veteran buyers is amazing. They buy properties that statistically are $70,000 high on average, right? So the, the median average loan amount for an FHA loan is 232 whereas the median loan amount for a VA loan is 305. And so that's, that's, a, that's a big spread. We've got stronger buyers who have higher, let's just put it this way, uh, financial character than, than median. Yep. Make more money than yep. median. Mm -hmm. Let's tackle this whole point about low down payment. And you said it right at the beginning, and I need buyer's agents to understand this. <coughs> Excuse me. Just because you can do 100% financing doesn't mean that you can't put down earnest money. And in Correct. fact, what ends up happening is we end up putting down $1,000. I see this all the time on contracts. Well, we're doing 100% financing. So let's just put down $1,000 and have that return to us at the closing. You can put down $100,000 if you want. You can put down $150,000 and still have the full amount returned to you with 100% financing. And that buyer can still put that, that deposit on the line. And you can even make that deposit or a portion of it non-refundable if you want to add that stickiness, that sort of skin in the game to it where people say, oh, it's 100% financing. You don't have skin in the game. My friend, they left their skin on the game. I'm sorry to say this. They left that in their service. 
Yeah. Okay. So number one, and then number two, you can put more money down as a veteran and then utilize that hundred percent financing right at the closing table and get your deposit back. Yeah. So, so this is a really, I have this dialogue with listing agents a lot. First things first, 28% of vets make a down payment. So 28% of them elect to do that on their own accord for, and, and you might say, well, why would they do that? There's multiple reasons. You could make a down payment for a lower monthly, obvious. You could make a down payment to lower your funding fee if you don't have any service connected disability, but really, and this is how I look at it when I'm speaking with a veteran client, let's say a veteran's buying an $800,000 house and they have a hundred thousand dollars that they're considering putting down. What's the average growth rate of growth over a long period of time, just in Connecticut, what's the average real estate growth in Connecticut? Would you say two, 3% a year over a long period of time? Long period. Yeah. Somewhere between one is one and a half to 2% over the course of basically like 10 to like 2019. Okay. So, so like we'll say 2%, we'll just use averages, yeah. right? So you have a hundred grand, you're going to put it into a property where it gets tied up and it's going to grow in that property at a rate of 2%. Or you have a hundred grand and you put it in your brokerage account and it grows at a rate of 7%, Seven, eight, yeah. 10%. 12%. From a net worth perspective for the veteran, if they have that cash, it doesn't necessarily even make sense to put it down. So the, the, what they've earned in terms of not putting it down might make their net worth higher. Demonstrating that you have the ability to make a down payment is just as powerful as making the down payment. That's itself. exactly it. James, that's what needs to be uh, propagated more is yeah. demonstrate the ability to do so doesn't necessarily mean I actually need to do it. Because Correct. financially and net worth wise, it makes sense. So in the seller's mind, I can see this myth is busted because simply it's this. The ability to put more money down is present. Their financial character is stronger. And number three, they make more money over the median course. So guys, I don't see this as a concern as you go into spring market and beyond that this should be a concern for you, for your buyers. Earnest money to earnest money deposit always trumps that. Put a large earnest money deposit. That's what I tell vets. You'll get it back at closing. Yeah. So if you're a vet, you want to have a conversation with us. Hey, listen, I actually do have, you know, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 in the bank. We can put that money down and just simply show our strength. And then you can get that money back at the closing. All right. So <laughs> here's another one. Uh, well, you know what, James? I don't know if I want to accept this VA because, you know, we're going to have problems with the appraisal. They're going to be difficult. And, uh, you know, those underwriters, you know, they, they just kind of, they just kind of nitpick everything. So here's my next question to you. Myth, VA loans are harder to get through underwriting. True or false? Absolutely false. The truth is they are the easiest loans to get through underwriting. How can this across. be, James? Everyone says otherwise. Yeah, I know. So this is a very widely misunderstood thing. Okay, so this is literally, so the VA 267 is the handbook. It's the guidebook for all VA guidelines, right? So any lender who's looking up a guide, they're looking in the VA 267. Here's what the 267 says, right? This is right in the handbook. And I'm reading this off the screen here. I got notes here. So if you guys see me looking down, it's because I'm looking at notes or whatever. <laughs> if you see me uh, looking down, it's because I'm just commenting on the- Texting your what? You text, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Underwriters are encouraged to consider every possible appropriate factor in seeking a proper basis for approving loan applications for a qualified veteran. Let me summarize that down. Here's what that basically means. The rules are the rules. They're not meant to be broken unless they are, okay? And, and what that means is this. If you can demonstrate that something is factually true and back it up, you can probably get an exception on something in VA underwriting. So let me give you an example. I had a, a veteran where they were co-signed on their mother's car. And the guideline says that if we can document that the mother has made 12 payments on the car, it can be omitted from their credit profile. Now, how you document that is you look at the bank statement. It's mom's bank statement. The payments go out 12 months in a row. She's making the payments. Well, cool. In this case, we didn't have that because mom was giving cash to the veteran who was making the payments for three months. And then we had nine. So we didn't have 12 months of statement. So we couldn't omit this liability. Well, we were able to write a clear explanation, document the cash deposits, put together a well thought out exception request. And that exception was granted. And here's what the VA says. This is straight out of the words of the, the mouth of Bill White, who wrote the 267 in 19. He was a, a part of that in around 1944 when the okay. GI Bill came out and all that. This is what he says. As long as lenders document their reasoning for decision 
it's extremely unlikely that VA staff will take issue with a decision <coughs> on a file. VA loans have the broadest scope of exception availability because they want us to make these loans for veterans. And on top of that, lenders want to make these loans. And you might ask, well, well why do lenders want to make these loans? Besides the fact that they're profitable in general, which is good for lenders, they actually have the lowest default rate of any loan product. And those and those two have got to be related, right? If I know that I, I'm not going to default on something, I'm highly likely to pay a little bit more for something that gives me more security. Why yeah, of course. Price that again? Oh, because yeah. they make more money and because their credit profile is stronger. That's right. So the VA gives a guarantee to the lender that says, if this loan defaults, we'll reimburse you 25% of the loan amount, which is a huge insurance policy on top of foreclosing on the house. So a lender's not going to lose any money on that. They want to approve those loans. On top of that, the default rate for VA financing is literally seven to one. FHA is seven times higher than oh, VA loans. And conventional loans are one and a half times higher than VA loans. And you might ask, well, why is that? I mean, some of the, here's some interesting facts about underwriting for VA loans that I doubt very many agents know. There's no minimum credit score. So wait a second. I can have a like 640 credit score and get a VA loan? You can have whatever the lender allows. The VA does not specify a minimum credit score. So there are lenders out there that go down to 500 on certain, you know, in, te in theory, they can go to 350 if they want. Now, no reasonable lender is going to do that because if you're at a 350 credit score, something else is very wrong, right? Yeah. But they'll justify their own, but there's no floor. There's also no maximum debt ratio. Can you, like, and I mean this wholeheartedly, you can have a 90% debt ratio. I'm not advocating that people have a 90% debt ratio, but let's say a guy makes $50,000 a month and he's using 90% of it on debt and he's got five grand left over and he's looking to buy a condo with a $1,000 payment. Got five grand left over, $1,000 condo. Is that guy going to default? No, here's why. The VA does not use debt to income ratio as a measurement for approval. They use something called residual income. Residual income looks at a much broader picture. It says, hey, let's take into account every expense that this household has, including childcare, electricity, utilities, what's left over afterwards. And if what's left over afterwards meets a minimum criteria that is set by the VA, that loan's approvable. So there's a lot of loans where the debt ratio is 70%. And like, if you just hear that, you're like, well, dang, that seems really high. That seems like a risky loan. But when you look at the facts of the loan, you look at the fact that we're including childcare in that debt ratio figure, it's really <coughs> not that high. You can have an FHA borrower with a 35% debt ratio and a 60% debt ratio VA loan that are identical, right? Why? Because VA includes childcare and the other one doesn't. So they're looking at an old school measurement called residual income, which does not have a cap on yeah. debt ratio. Let, let's talk about that old school because, you know, sometimes I, I remember running into a guy once and a uh, very wealthy man that had a lot of money in the bank and uh, was retired and uh, didn't have some of the creative financing options that you did. And this was years and years ago. And he was denied a loan for a $400,000 property that we were looking for him and his, his, his wife to downsize to. And he was like, I have enough money in the bank. He told me, I have $5 million in the bank. If I could buy this property over and over and over and over again, but I don't have the income due to retirement. So therefore they won't provide me the loan. And he was looking for this old school approach. And I've run into this so many times, James, where people just say, you know, I'm good. I want to go with my bank because, you know, I've banked there for a long time. I'm really good with these guys. They're just going to give me a loan. I always pay my bills. You know, can we just be reasonable about this? And that's what I want to talk about for just one moment. People think that underwriting is this idea of do you fit within the grid? Are you within the grid? And some of that is absolutely true. But the idea behind this is that there is rationale that can be that should be given. That's what the underwriter should do when they look at this rationally. Does this actually make sense? And the ability of what people want is, can you hear me out? Can we just have a dialogue here? Like, I'm really good. I pay my bills on this stuff, but I just happen to have a little bit of debt. Yeah. I really like I'm good with like paying my bills, but I, I went through a divorce or had some really bad medical, whatever it was. And my credit score dipped. You have that ability with a veteran's loan to still get approved, where in other loan programs, you may not because there's so much looking at the grid and do you fit in the box with that? And I think yeah. if, if listing agents truly understood that, man, there's way greater opportunity to get around things and to actually make the loan go through where you might not have that flexibility on other loan products. 
Yeah. So VA has what I would like to call make sense underwriting in general, yeah. right? Makes sense underwriting. And if it makes sense, here's what I tell people. If it makes sense and you're telling the truth, then there's some paper trail somewhere yep. that we can document that what you're saying is actually true. A, an underwriter is not going to just give me a pass because I say they should. I have to document what I'm doing, right? but it doesn't have to fit the specific traditional set of documentation, there is room for flexibility. There are black and white guides in VA financing, like any program, like right? Yeah. There are black and white guides that we cannot break rules on. But things like credit, things like, like I just, I picked up a loan the other day where USA denied it because this guy had nine collections and they were old collections, old from when he had a divorce, he got caught up. The story makes sense. He's back on track for well over a year. His credit score is fine. Guy makes great money. Don't load. It's a great loan. He just like had a bad run a couple of years ago where it's like the whole world blew up and they just denied the loan because they don't want to accept that stuff. Well, we, we easily approved it because we easily made sense of the situation, told the story, justified what we've done to get back on track. And it makes sense. Right. And so they give us that sense of flexibility. And it's, so as far as getting these loans through, it is so much easier, in my opinion, to get VA loans approved when we're telling the truth and can document the facts of a situation, especially if it's credit related. I think that lo I think this uh, this myth is busted. What do you think? Definitely busted. All right, let's keep going. We got a couple of more here. So obviously, if you're watching this and you have questions, I wish someone would answer. Please put this in the comments. And also, if you want a copy of this book, also drop that in the comments. If you've uh, ever you know, been on the side of a VA loan and you're an agent, you're like, this is actually good stuff, please put that as well so you know that as we go through this, we can add more to it. Depends on how much uh, comments we get here. All right, so quick one here. VA loans take longer to close, right? Like, hey, shouldn't these be like 45-day closings, James? Yeah. And like, doesn't the appraiser get like tons of time in order to, to do this appraisal? Like, I got to compete with someone else who can close in 30 days. Can you Can you help me? Yeah, sm smidge of truth, but basically not true, right? So let's go back. Where does this myth come from? There was a time years ago where all VA loans had to go out for third-party VA approval, right? Okay. So that used to exist. So anytime you talk to an agent who's like, I've been in the business for 40 years, I'm like, okay, you've been in the business long enough to remember when VA yeah. loans went to the VA for right. approval. You know, they remember a time where that was true. Automatic authority was given to lenders years ago, and most lenders now, any lender you would ever refer for the most part, has what's called automatic authority. That means if they get an AUS approval, they have the authority to approve the loan without actually sending it off to the VA for that, right? On average, a VA loan closes within five days of the conventional turn time nationally, right? And I'll tell you, we close lots of VA loans in 21 days. Our benchmark in general for all conventional FHA financing is 21 days. We try to close VA in 21. We don't always close in 21. Why? And I'll tell you specifically why in Connecticut. There's a chart on the VA website that breaks down regionally throughout the country. And this is based on how many appraisers they have in the panel and how spread out they are. The appraiser has a specified amount of time to remit the report from the date of inspection and in Connecticut, that timeline is 10 days, which is an astronomically long amount of time, right. right? Now, once in a while, most of the VA appraisers are like the normal guys. Like, like some of our favorite appraisers do VA. They go out and we get the report the next day and we're done and it's fine. And that's most of the time. Once in a while, we'll get an old school VA appraiser who just wants to take the full time and they'll take the whole 10 days. And there's really not much we can do until sure. they exceed that 10 day timeline. So the only smidge of truth in terms of it taking longer to get through underwriting or close really has to do with, is the specific appraiser assigned going to take the full 10 days? Even if they do, if the lender orders the appraisal day one, there's really no reason that it shouldn't be able to close within 21 to 30 days unless the listing agent cannot schedule the appraiser for two weeks or something like that. Let, let's, let's talk about that too, because just as a listing agent myself, I've run into this often. Agents who do not understand that Tidewater is available, you want that timeline for the appraiser because you want the trade of that benefit, the, the benefit and length of time or that risk, whatever you see that as, the benefit is you get Tidewater. And Tidewater, James, you explain this better than I can. Yeah. On the listing agent side, it's this. 
hey, if the value doesn't come in at the purchase price or greater, and normally it would cause some sort of reconsideration or renegotiation, the listing agent has the opportunity to present formally within 48 hours. Hey, here are other comparables that you yes. may not have considered and additional information that you may not have already noted within your report. And the appraiser needs to comment on those items that were presented. Why? Because the appraisers and the agents don't always see eye to eye on certain things. And that's okay. I'm a certified appraiser as well. And I realize that I don't actually like see the property the way that you do all the time. So I think it's a huge benefit. Yeah. So you're touching on myth six, which is appraisals are tougher for, uh, for VA loans. We, VA loans don't take longer to close. Let's address the question, are VA appraisals harder than regular appraisals, right? Because that's a different question, but let's answer it because they go together in this instance, right? So this is the VA's philosophy in general. We have a panel and our panel is people who have been certified. They may be close in proximity, they may not. Because of that, we need to rely on the expertise of the agents to influence value. And that is uniquely different than any other loan program. You do a conventional loan or an FHA loan, the agents do not have the opportunity to influence value, whereas the VA invites them to legally. So it's the only loan program where you can legally influence value and you get three opportunities to do that. Okay, so let's let's talk through what that means. Now, you alluded to this a minute ago. Most of you who are watching this will have no idea what the phrase Tidewater is. And when Tidewater is initiated, you won't have any idea what's happening unless you take very careful attention here. That's correct. Here's what happens. When a VA appraisal is going to come in low, the phone of myself or the buyer's agent will ring and it will say, I am initiating Tidewater. And that's the appraiser. Or they'll put it through the portal and they'll send a message that says, I am initiating Tidewater. And 90% of people who don't know what Tidewater is are like, okay, so when will we get the appraisal? And he's like, <laughs> he's like 48 hours. And they're like, okay, click. And they hang up the phone. And like, they don't even know what just happened. Right? right. And why they make it confusing, I have no idea. But here's what it means. The appraiser is saying, you guys, your water level's here. My water level's here. I need you to bring in tide water to bring me up to where you're at in value. I'm not able to figure out why your property is worth what you say. But I, but I need you to help me. And so you have 48 hours from the time they initiate to provide three comps, which must be included and commented on in the appraisal. Now, I've had two Tidewaters in the last, I don't know, four months. I have one that's being re reconsidered today. And we, we go back to the agents. Usually the buyer and the seller agent get together. They provide the comps and we put together a story. We send it in. And a lot of times those, those appraisals come in at value. Sometimes they come in a little light, right? And so in talking about appraisals being tougher when it comes to value, let's say that a Tidewater is initiated and the value still comes in low, okay? So we're all disappointed, came in 10K low after Tidewater. Our comps are in there. They've been considered whatever. <coughs> what, what then happens? So there's two more opportunities to rebut that value, which is just not the case with other loan types. So what are they? The staff appraisal reviewer, the SAR, <coughs> is an underwriter at the lender who reviews the appraisal and signs off on it. And they have the same authority on their collar as the actual appraiser. One of the things that most real estate agents do not know is that on VA financing, the appraiser does not determine the value of the property. The appraiser does not determine the value of the property. The staff appraisal reviewer determines the value of the property. I just need you to say that again, because for a lot of guys, they're going to be like, well, wait a second. What are you? Wait, what? Are you serious? The appraiser is making what? a suggestion of value. There you go. The staff appraisal reviewer is looking at the appraisal and issuing a notice of value, which is the determination of what the house is worth. Let, let's note on that. Certified appraiser. The definition of an appraisal is an expert opinion yes. of the value. It is an expert opinion. We've been to school. We know how to do this. We've been trained, have a license from the DCP. It does not mean that is the value. And what you want is you want reasonability when you are buying and selling real estate in some industry that is generally not reasonable. <laughs> and so this is an amazing opportunity. The, the staff appraisal reviewer will review the appraisal and they'll assign the value. Now, the truth is this. 
they, in theory, can raise or lower the value if they determine that they need to for some reason. And we can dialogue with them. Now, I will tell you, getting a, a SAR to overturn an appraiser's value is like a minor miracle. Like, basically, Jesus walking on water type stuff. Like, probably, I've never seen a SAR do this. But there's a third opportunity that I, that I have seen that works quite well. And it's called an amicability letter. So let's say Tidewater is initiated. You submit comps. We still come in low. We call the SAR. They, they agree with the appraiser's value. We're 10K short. Can't make the deal work. I had this happen uh, two months ago with um, someone from down south in Connecticut. We were 10 grand short. The venture needed the 10 grand because they had a seller concession. So the deal literally died without this 10K. There was no way to make up the money on this. So what did we do? We put together a letter called a formal reconsideration of value. And we send it to the regional loan center, the RLC in Ohio, who oversees the entire Northeast for VA overall and yep. VA appraisers. We appealed to them and said, hey, listen, we're 10K short. We would like you to reconsider guaranteeing this loan at the contract value to make it work. And here's how we justified it. This particular property was in Meriden and the, one of the, it was on the outskirts of Meriden over by, um, um, Middlefield, right? So yeah, okay. we made the argument that Meriden was like a bullseye and that there was a comp nine miles away by Cheshire in town that was more like the subject property than the ones that were in closer proximity in the middle. Yeah. We wrote this letter signed by the buyer and the seller and the VA overturned the appraiser and the staff appraisal reviewer brought that value up 10K and we got our value in on that deal. And so the point is you've got three opportunities. And so our VA appraisal is harder. There's a smidge of truth that the minimum property conditions can be a challenge if the house has issues and you know what they are. And if you want to talk about solutions to that, I got a lot of, <coughs> a lot of solutions to that that we can talk about. That right. is the only thing that makes them harder. As far as value goes, they are superior in every way to every other loan type. Why? Because if you know what you're doing and how to navigate the system, you legally have the opportunity to influence that value, which is not true for any other appraisal. A hundred percent. And you touched on a subject. I think people are, you know, hey, what about this like chipping paint and HUD minimum guideline standards and everything? And there are so many solutions that buyers and yes. sellers are willing to work with yep. along with the real estate agents. That's an easier solve yeah. any day. Let, let, let me let me tell you this. It is easier to solve. I've got some chipping paint on a windowsill. You tell me. Easier to solve. Chipping paint on a windowsill or hey, we're short 10 grand. Like chipping, what's it easier to chipping solve? Chipping paint. Uh, yeah, of course. And so like, that's not even like on the table right now for us to, to really go through. So in my opinion, busted once again on this myth, I got like two more for you, dude, if that's cool. If we've got yeah. some time, I know we're, uh, we're cranking here. Seller must pay for the veterans fees. Oh man. Like this is one of those where it's like, Hey, I, you know, I got a problem. I don't want to pay for anybody else's stuff. Uh, you know, what are you talking about? He, I got to pay for his termite inspection. There's no termites here. That's so. the, that's the best. I that's love this the one. Best one, right? Dude, it's like 75 bucks and the seller's like, no way. I'm not yeah. doing that. It's uh, it's laughable. It, this one's really laughable. This is actually my favorite myth. Um, because it, it couldn't be further from the truth. Basically here's what it comes down to. I'll just make it really simple. People have been confused about, never have the seller been required to pay the veterans fees, right? There's a whole, this is what it comes down to. There's a list of fees in the VA handbook called unallowable fees, right? Okay. And you would think that everything that's on a list called unallowable would be unallowable wow. for the veteran to pay. You would think that that would be, because that's logical. Unallowable fees, veteran can't pay it, right? The problem is this. It's like reading scripture without reading the whole, you read a little, little verse without reading the, the, the chapter, or without reading the book, the context is lost. If you read the unallowable fees list without reading the page before and the page after, you're missing the context of what this page is about. The fees on that, on that page are only unallowable to the extent that the borrower has already paid a minimum, certain maximum allowed by the VA. So let me explain. Lenders used to charge back in the day veterans 1% origination fee to do their loans. Ooh. And so the VA said, if you pay 1%, you can't then nickel and dime these guys with all this stuff. Wow. And so to the extent that the veteran is not paying 1%, everything on that list, including pest and termite, has always been allowed. Now, this is hyper convoluted in Connecticut, and I'll tell you yeah. why. And I don't know how on earth we can get this undone. <clears throat> 
The VA released a circular last year clarifying this issue, saying, hey, we realize people are confused. The seller doesn't have to pay anything for the veteran. They can pay everything. So it now says that in writing. There shouldn't be any confusion. Here's why it's convoluted in Connecticut. I don't know why on earth we, we the Board of Realtors doesn't contract. change this. Dude, we they the wrote contract. the contract. To it says right in the Greater Hartford Board of Realtors contract that it's going to be paid by the seller. The problem is this. If the contract states that it's required, then the underwriter enforces the contract. Of course. So all of the agents in Connecticut who are confused about this need to take the pen and cross it out of the contract. It's not an issue if it's crossed out. Cross it out of the contract, initial it, buyer and seller. You can put in the other comments, seller's happy to pay pest, termite, whatever. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. You know a veteran should that? never lose a house over $150 pest fee. You know what's so wild, dude, is that you know we service multiple states and we talk with guys all over the country. And this is not in other i mean they're in other contracts around the country but like it's blatant in connecticut and it's i terrible. think it's, it's i think it's a bl it's a blatant slap honestly uh to, to to veterans and it doesn't serve them well because honestly it just you know an uneducated listing agent looks at that and says well that's what it says in the contract here so that's what we're going to do so advice to buyers agent cross it directly out initial yeah. full size we got this have a convo with your buyer Hey, this was written in a long time ago and was never removed, but you're cool because you're good with paying that. Talk to your home inspector. They'll get you They'll get you a pest uh, inspector. Yeah, you know. we're not advocating, not advocating that the veteran pay for it. Right. I actually, here's what I would advise agents. Find an inspector who you love and say, I want to send all my VA clients to you. Will you please waive the, 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 the pest fee? For these guys as a courtesy for their service most inspectors will be like yes it's a hundred bucks i'll just do it of course go for that the bottom line is this though never lose the deal over something like nonsensical i i hope that the greater harford board takes that out of the contract at some point Agreed. soon i think that would serve veterans really well yeah i think you just said something there that before we get to our last myth i just want to say never lose a deal over something nonsensical well it makes sense to those who have the sense to listen now Yes. The hard part is, is deals are lost for veterans every day due to lack of education. So thank you again for educating on this. All right. I got one more for you, dude. You can only have one VA loan at a time. I get this because guys will call me. They'll say, hey, you know what, man, should I use it? It's almost like a, it's almost like a get out of jail free card or like some sort of one time use. If I use this, I don't I'm going to save my VA loan. This is it. This is my one benefit. So walk me through this. Is this more or less like a license that I can hold and I can just, or is it like a one time use it and you're done? It's a gift card. Yes. Great question. So where does this myth come from? This myth comes from another myth. That's also not true that you can only have one FHA loan at a time. Right. And so yeah. people think, well, you can only have one FHA loan. So you can only have one VA loan. In other words, you can only have one government loan. Yeah. If you think about this before I even walk you through the facts, if you think about it, it doesn't even make sense that it would be true. Think about a veteran lifestyle. They go to Fort Bragg. They buy a property. Mm -hmm. A year right. later, they get PCS orders to Hawaii. Yeah. Can they not buy a property I'm again? Do this. How do they buy a home? What is their, do they They have to live on base? What, what is the option? It doesn't even logically make sense that it would be that way. So here's how it works. You can do whatever you want. The VA does not limit how many VA loans that you take out at a time. What they limit is how many you take out with 0% down or the maximum amount of financeable properties with 0% down. So how does it work? If you've never used your VA entitlement before, you have what's called full entitlement. Or if you had a house that was sold and your entitlement is restored, you have full entitlement. If you have full entitlement, it means that none of your entitlement is attached to a property at this time. When that is true, there is no limitation on the purchase price other than what the lender sets. So, you know, like for us at Movement, I think our, our, our VA cap is 5 million. It might be three. I don't know. I've never done a VA loan that big. It's whatever the lender sets. The VA says you can buy whatever you want with zero down. doesn't matter. I'm not advocating that people buy a $5 million property with zero down. I'm just saying it's allowable, right? So on first use with full entitlement, no cap, do whatever you want. If you bought a house in Fort Bragg and you got PCS orders to Hawaii and you want to buy a second house, well, now there's a calculation on how much you can buy with zero down. You can still buy with zero down, but it's capped. So how does this work? 
Let's say, so the conforming loan limit in the U.S. this year is 726. Most people know that. Let's say you bought a house that was 226 <laughs> at Fort Bragg, 226K, and that's how much entitlement was used. It's a, this is a crude math example to keep it simple for you guys. But basically, if the conforming loan limit is 726 and I bought 226 in Fort Bragg, I got 500K available to buy in Hawaii with zero down. Now, what if I want to buy 600K? Well, I can do that, but I have to start making a down payment above 500K. So the delta between five and six is 100 grand. I have to do 25% of the delta. So if I'm buying a $600,000 house in Hawaii after I tied up 226 in in uh, in Georgia or wherever, I've got to put down $25,000. Now, $25,000 in a $600,000 house, I mean, if you were doing a conventional loan, you would need a minimum of $30,000 down. So it's still lower down right. payment than, than almost any other loan product when you do this. But the combination of the entitlement is capped at the conforming loan limit for 0% down. You can go beyond it, but when you do, you must make a down payment. This myth also plays out for people who lost entitlement because of a uh, foreclosure or something like that. Say you yeah. foreclosed on a property, you will lose the entitlement that was attached to that home forever, right? But your bonus entitlement will remain in effect. And so you can use the remaining balance to buy another like, property like with zero percent down. I had a condo, 150 grand that I borrowed, not the total purchase price. Yep. I borrowed 150,000. Loan limits to uh, 726. I I lose that. Let's say it was like years ago. My remainder, my balance is still available in in entitlement. 576 would be available. I have my calculator on my desk here. You could still buy up to 576 with zero percent down. Um, you could never go back to the original full entitlement because you lost a portion. But what's you you don't lose your bonus entitlement because of a foreclosure, you know, and that's a pretty cool thing. So you can. Um, you can buy multiple properties with this product as often as you would like. It just comes down to how often and how much can you buy with 0% down. And that's where the tolerance cap comes in. You know, James, uh, I've been selling real estate. Oh, man, I sound like an old realtor now. I've been selling real estate. I've been selling real estate for over 10 years. And I remember, we'll, we'll kind of like wrap up with this, right? Put any more of your comments down here in the webinar. We'll get them to you right away, obviously comment below if you want a copy of James's book, schedule a buyer consult here with us and our team as we're fully educated. These are agents who are educated. Here's why I'm going to say this. When I got started in real estate, I remember I got my first listing and I was told by a broker, do not accept VA deals. And I don't know why anybody accepts VA deals. They're horrible to deal with and they just listed all the myths. And dude, it is just, it is knowledge is power. And with lack of education, everybody loses, literally everyone. The veteran loses most importantly, followed by the buyers and the sellers who can get great prices for their houses, the communities who could have more veterans and what they bring to the community. And it's just, man, it's just absolutely worth it to share this video right now. I know it takes two seconds. I know we've been going for 40 minutes, but these 45 minutes that we're on here, maybe worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to a veteran, maybe a different life for them, maybe a way better down payment, maybe an actual listing agent who actually knows how to sell more properties. Now. Would you just take a minute, like literally just click it right now, share this video with a friend of yours who you know either sells real estate, number one, two, actually just works in the real estate industry, maybe a loan officer even, or number three, you know someone who served in one of our military branches. That would be amazing if you could do that right now. James, what is advice that you have to give to a guy who just got into the business and he's like, I, I just want to connect with more veterans, man. I just want to serve that community better. What's one of the ways that you've really kind of built that as so many veterans love to go to you for loans? Yeah. I mean, this is what I would tell you. First of all, if you educate yourself and you learn the language of the veteran, you're going to connect with them in a more meaningful way. Yeah. When you understand what their lifestyle is like and you can relate, <laughs> speak with them about, you don't you don't, you haven't had service. That's fine. They're not looking for that, but they want you to understand it. Here's the best way that you can connect truly with a veteran. Demonstrate to them that you understand how to present an offer that a seller will accept for a veteran. Okay. And so here's three tips that I'll leave you with that will give you help you make stronger offers that a veteran a seller will accept. Number one, cross out the thing in the contract we talked about, sign it, explain to the listing agent that fees do not need to be paid. 
Number two, make a large earnest money deposit. They will get it back. Put it in there so you can demonstrate that you have skin in the game. Number three, and I realize that some people will say, my broker doesn't allow this. Look, I don't care. Do what you want. Don't do it. It's up to you. It doesn't matter to me. I just tell you this works. When a veteran writes a letter about buying the home, you know, the love letter, everyone kind of, everyone has opinions about that. It's a different letter. When a veteran explains what it meant to serve their country and be shipped all over the world on PCS orders, and then they explain what it means to put roots down for their family and what it means for their kids to have a consistent place to go to school for the foreseeable future, that's a very different letter. And that seller will read that and understand that they've selected this home, they want to do it. That's a pro move that really helps demonstrate this is a different family. It means something different to have a home than it does for people like you and me. Not that it's not important for us, but we haven't been shipped all over the world doing this type of service. And the last thing is this, have the loan officer call the listing agent and make sure that if they do think some of these myths are true, that they get overturned, that we're educating these people. That's the best way that you can connect with veterans, demonstrate that you know how to present an offer a seller will accept, they will refer you to all of their friends. They are the most loyal clients on the planet. I mean that wholeheartedly. Guys, if you're uh, my my message is always to real estate agents out there. That's who I that's who I serve. Uh, my goal is to educate and accelerate agents' careers all the time through either a team or through coaching aspects. My encouragement to you is this: share this video. The reason why is if you can make this education go viral, you know that you it's hard to educate a listing agent in a short period of time when they've kind of already made up their mind that they want to accept a conventional offer rather than your veterans offer, which is higher and stronger and better. And you're, it's a more qualified person. It's really challenging for them to watch 45 minutes and be like, yeah, you know what? I've changed my mind after I watched your video. Share this right now on your timelines. Share this. If you're watching this webinar, send this out to someone who sells real estate. And the reason is, is because if they read this, they're going to be serving other people a lot better. James, I can't thank you enough, man. How do people get your book? I love it. You're well, not- so I just finished the third edition. Okay. It should be pressed. And then I have a PDF now I'll give to you. You can give out to the folks on here. No problem. Yeah. Um, but the actual physical copies will be in hand. What do we use these for? I give these out at the National Guard Yellow Ribbon Ceremonies where I teach. And I give these to my real estate partners who give them to their clients. So you do a buyer console with a veteran, you hand them the physical book, right? Like this is a physical book that breaks down, you know, you want to find out quickly what's going on with the appraisal credit requirements. It's right here. You give this to a veteran buyer and it gives you a measure of authority. So we use this as a resource to serve them, but also to serve my partners. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, Hey, have you ever worked with a veteran loan? It's like, yeah, I actually have the book on how to do this. And we work with one of the top guys in the entire country on how to do veteran loans. Uh, My friends, thank you so much uh, for being a part of this live and this webinar and, uh, and taking the time. We know it, it it takes time in order to do this. Um, We, we, we know also that education is important. It's one of the most important things and actually provides an open doors for people. So we hope that this opened a door for you today. We hope that uh, you've had the ability to uh, learn a little bit more and be able to, to serve uh, someone in, in the, in the military community, Again, guys, I can't thank you enough. Please reach out to James uh, at Movement Mortgage. Man, drop some uh, love in the comments for him. He would love to connect with you. Serve buyers, not only in the veteran community, but also anybody else that's out there. So James serves. He's been serving uh, my team. I run a real estate team in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Florida. And this guy's been serving us for years on end. He understands and listens. That is his superpower, man. He is a listener and he knows how to get deals done. Why? Because he knows how to present after he's listened. And so if you found value with this presentation, if you found value with James actually educating where most have just glossed over and said, yeah, we can do it or whatever, would you do me a favor and drop this Drop in some comments, say, I want to be, get connected with James. You know, this is the type of guy who I want on my side. And if he knows this much about VA loans, what else does he know about? I'd love to connect you with him personally. And I'd love for you guys to get his book or share that with a friend. Thanks so much for watching, guys. And can't wait to see you as we uh, as we serve you in the veteran community. See ya. Thanks, James.